A very wise person once said that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Guess what TNA's doing? Now I'll credit them for one thing. After Bound for Glory, they did a pretty decent job of keeping Jeff Hardy and Rob Van Dam away from each other. If that was going to be the big match to end this immortal storyline, Booking 101 tells us that you'd want to prevent them from interacting, to keep them as far away from each other as possible, keep throwing up roadblocks in front of Rob Van Dam, and build anticipation for when he finally gets his hands on Jeff Hardy. Now, where they failed was in providing compelling roadblocks for Rob Van Dam, because having him feud with the other EV2 guys was just stupid. No one cared about it. Nevertheless, they did manage to go several months where Rob Van Dam and Jeff Hardy had virtually no interaction. So, I think there would have been some legit intrigue and excitement with these guys finally faced off on pay-per-view. Then TNA decided it would be a better idea to give this match away on free TV with no hype, no promotion, and no prior announcement. One point one rating this match got. TNA, this is not me being a mark. It's not me being a smartass. This is just me asking an honest question. When has this booking philosophy ever worked out for you? When has it ever paid off? You have a big match that was almost five months in the making, and instead of saving it for a big pay-per-view, or at the very least a heavily promoted impact like the March 3rd show, for example, you give it away in a completely random episode, deliberately downplaying it so a lot of fans probably had no idea it was even happening. Hell, even Hardy and Van Dam didn't seem that excited about it. Surprise, surprise, it didn't pop a rating. Viewership was down across the board this week, probably because no one gave a rat's ass about the Against All Odds fallout because you totally undersold that show too. If you'd made a big deal out of hyping up this match on Impact, or, God forbid, a week in advance, there might have been more interest in this show. But you didn't, and there wasn't. Now something I will grant you is the Ken Anderson thing. It looks like the Hardy-Van Dam feud may be getting changed to incorporate Anderson after the one-month title switch. I still think they should have kept the belt on him, but it's good that they're not just sweeping him off the table, at least. Now, in keeping with this theme of doing the same thing over and over again, you have Kaz say that he's going to return the X Division to the forefront. TNA has been saying this about every six months for the last three or four years now, and it still has not happened. In fact, they had Christopher Daniels saying pretty much the exact same thing this time last year, and then they fired him. By now, we have reached a point where no one believes TNA when they say this anymore. You want to make the X Division relevant again? Good for you. You want the fans to believe you when you say that? Then stop talking about it and do it. And for the record, that is not what you're doing right now. First, Kazarian says he's going to return the X Division to the forefront, and then you put him in a match with a Jersey Shore parody character that doesn't even wrestle X Division style. The match is less than two minutes long, it ends in a DQ, and it turns out to be more about Cookie and Tracy than anything else. A nice job blowing Tracy's surprise return, by the way. Stuff like this was never what the X Division was about. Robbie shouldn't even be in the X Division in the first place because he doesn't wrestle that style. Kaz needs to be feuding with someone like Chris Sabin or Amazing Red or Max Buck, someone who wrestles like an X Division competitor, and that's not Robbie E. Robbie E is a joke. That loser needs to go back to jobbing on Explosion. Anywho, those are my main points. I'm stepping off my soapbox now, but I have a few observations about things that really left me scratching my head this week. The show starts with an Immortal promo, because that's how they have to start the show every freaking week now, with another Immortal promo. So, as usual, Bischoff's doing all the talking, and among other things, he congratulates Matt Hardy, Gunner, Murphy, and Rob Terry on their performances at Against All Odds, and he actually says, get this, you proved you were the equals of your opponents. And that was some really funny revisionist history right there, because on the pay-per-view I was watching last Sunday, Matt Hardy lost to Rob Van Dam, and Gunnar Murphy and Rob Terry pretty much got embarrassed by Beer Money and Steiner. But Bischoff is happy about this. He thinks they all did great. No, they didn't. This just continues to baffle me to no end. Matt Hardy... Okay, at least he had a decent showing. But those other three are probably the biggest collective waste of human plasma on your entire roster. They're horrible. You know they're horrible. You constantly have to book around their weaknesses in the ring to try to hide the fact that they're horrible. And yet, you continue to use them. And yet you have Bischoff lying through his teeth saying these guys are awesome.
What the hell are you doing? Then you have a match with Hernandez versus Doug Williams where 90% of the focus is on the knockouts brawling at ringside, and then the match is over in under three minutes. Why are these things happening at the same time? Why are Sarita and Rosita coming out with Hernandez all of a sudden? Where did that come from? Because they're Hispanic? Is that all the explanation we get? That's kind of weak. And oh my god, who the hell did Doug Williams piss off? Do you realize that you completely ruined him here? I mean, if you want him to lose a match to Hernandez, okay. But he gets destroyed way too quickly, and the focus of the segment is on everything but the match. And if Doug Williams isn't even important enough to have the cameras pointed at him while he's being destroyed, the message you send to the audience is that this guy means absolutely nothing. And why the hell are you doing that after you spent the last year building up Doug Williams as a really credible upper mid-carder? He can beat AJ Styles, but he can't last more than three minutes with Hernandez? TNA, shit booking like this is why you have so many problems building new stars. Your roster's too damn overcrowded, so you didn't have a spot for Doug Williams after he lost the TV title. Ergo, just like that, he becomes a jobber. Within the span of two months, you took Doug Williams from being arguably one of the top babyfaces on the show and turned him into a go-nowhere jobber, just like you did to Jay Lethal, just like you're doing to Chris Sabin. Pretty much everything you did with Doug Williams in 2010 has now been invalidated. Congratulations. And this didn't even do anything for Hernandez. The focus of the segment wasn't on him either. And if he's going over Doug Williams that quickly and that easily with so little attention paid to it, the only thing that gets conveyed is that a win over Doug Williams really doesn't mean anything anymore. Is it really too much to ask for the focus of a match to be on the match and not on stuff happening outside the ring that has nothing to do with the match? So the stuff with the knockouts set up a tag team match for later on. The Beautiful People versus Sarita and Rosita, who I call Spanish Fly because that just sounds like a catchy tag team name to me. The heels win, and then Velvet demands a clean match with Sarita because she always has Sarita beat until Sarita cheats to win. Again, more revisionist history. As I recall, Sarita's beaten Velvet cleanly more often than not. Anyway, Sarita gets Velvet to put her career on the line in the next match. I assume that's going to happen on the March 3rd show. And this was weird. I never like this angle, where the heel goads the babyface into putting something on the line when they don't have to, when they have no reason to, be it their career or a title shot or something else. Unless you're really careful with how you book that, it just makes the babyface look like a complete idiot. But I think in this situation, it worked for a couple reasons. Number one, Velvet's not that bright. Let's face it, as a character, Velvet Sky is pretty damn stupid. I mean, she's the one who thought Daphne was Sarah Palin, remember? Number two, Velvet has an ego problem. She's so convinced that she's better than Sarita. Of course, everyone knows she's not. But she's so convinced that she can beat Sarita that she's willing to do anything to prove it. Number three, Sarita's beaten Velvet like 50 times in a row now. So I think it makes sense that Velvet would be so frustrated that she'd be willing to put her career on the line if Sarita would just give her one more shot. Just one more shot! So, oddly enough, this worked for me. I'm assuming Winter's gonna get involved in that match somehow and Velvet will lose, and I would pop so big for that because that would mean that Velvet would presumably be off TV and we wouldn't have to watch her wrestle for a while. And that would be... fantastic. Speaking of people putting their careers on the line, didn't Kurt Angle retire again last Sunday? He lost to Jared at the pay-per-view, and then he left his wrestling boots in the ring, which the announcers told us means he's retiring. And here we get no acknowledgement of that whatsoever. Really? Nothing? You're just... you're, you're not even going to mention that? Okay. Ric Flair made his return to the show when he turned on Fortune. And rather than save the inevitable Ric Flair-AJ Styles match for a pay-per-view, or the March 3rd show, the writers decide that, slow build be damned, they're just gonna blow through that next week. Although, give them credit for one thing, at least they had AJ make the challenge a week in advance instead of springing it on us completely randomly. Then Scott Steiner challenged Rob Terry to a pose-off next week. That's right. A Rob Terry-Scott Steiner pose-off gets announced a week in advance. But Jeff Hardy versus Rob Van Dam? We're just gonna throw that one out there with no hype and no advance notice. Because that makes sense. Because that's good booking in the, in the minds of the TNA writers. 
Ken Anderson and Eric Bischoff had a promo segment, and I actually thought this part was really good. Just because you've got the former world champion who wants a rematch, and he's pissed off that he's not getting it. You don't always see that on this show. A lot of the time, when a champion loses their title, they don't get a rematch. Sometimes they don't even acknowledge the fact that they lost it. So I like this part a lot. It gave the main event some kind of hype. Anderson was really good. He looked fired up. In fact, Anderson looked more excited about being the referee in the title match than Rob Van Dam was about being in the title match. At least Anderson was acting like he really wanted the title. Rob Van Dam was more like this. Yeah, you know, whatever. The title's an added bonus and everything, but what I'm really excited about is finally getting my hands on Jeff Hardy, because I've been waiting months to get my hands on Jeff Hardy. He was one of my closest friends in this business, and he stabbed me in the back, man. So finally getting to beat the life out of him with my bare hands, that's what I'm looking forward to the most. Hey, has anybody seen my pot? And that brings us to the main event. And again, the booking here just baffles me. I thought the whole storyline here, and literally half the intrigue of this match, came from Jeff Hardy never having been able to beat Rob Van Dam. They said this when they had that TV match last year. Jeff's never been able to beat this guy. And instead of really playing that up and milking it, I don't think they even mentioned it here at all. Jeff beats Van Dam supposedly for the first time ever, and it's like no big deal. It's not important at all. Why in the world would you not want to play that up? You're just robbing this match of any kind of drama that it could have and should have had. I don't know what these writers are thinking. I really don't. I've tried to logic it out. I've tried to make sense of their thought process so many times, and I just can't. There is no logic or sense to be found in TNA's booking. It's just not there. But you know what? Regardless, I'm feeling pretty good. As much as I bitch and complain about this show, I'm actually in a good mood. Because they just had a pay-per-view with three gimmick matches, and I got through it. <laughs> I didn't have to go to the hospital or anything. Ordinarily, that might have been enough to throw me into another seizure. But now that I've got the gimmick overload alarm, <laughs> I think everything's going to be okay from now on. That, uh-oh, uh I see someone who's not happy about this. Fuck you. Eh, you're just pissed off because your gimmicks don't have any power over me anymore. <laughs> oh man, it feels great to finally be able to say that. Damn, I feel good. In fact, I feel so good... I bet I could even survive a hair versus hair gimmick. Me versus fourth dimension fool killer in a hair versus hair match. I would totally win that match, by the way. Really? Yeah. So, that's what you think? Yeah, that's what I think. What was that, the finger poke of doom? What's that supposed to do?